Claudio C'était donc toi depuis tout ce temps I met Paulina on a winter night in Berlin. She was giving a lecture about a fascinating topic, love. Paulina Aronson is a sociologist who studies emotions. At that time, she was studying how love is experienced and perceived differently in Russia, where she grew up, versus our perception in the Western world, where she currently lives. In the Western world, we tend to see love as a choice, a choice we make more or less consciously. Let's take a man from New York and call him Jim. If Jim falls in love with a married person in a monogamous relationship, Jim will visit a psychologist. He will try to understand why he made such a poor decisions and he will try to grow and improve himself. Jim lives in the romantic regime of choice. In Russia and in the post-Soviet world, you don't choose love. Love chooses you. In the traditional Russian culture, a man in love with a married, an available person will suffer, and that's it. He will accept his sorrow as a part of his destiny. Because since the day he was born, he was told that suffering is inevitable. This is what she calls the regime of fate. I found Paulina's theory of romantic regimes brilliant and fascinating, and also a bit scary. Who am I outside of my culture? Would I still be me if I was born and raised on the other side of the world? Is there such a thing as pure love that we share everywhere in the world and in any era? That was a big debate we had at the bar after her lecture. Obviously, one bottle of wine was not enough to find all the answers to all those deep questions. Ever since Russia invaded Ukraine, my friend Paulina questioned her own theory of romantic regimes. She does not want to play Vladimir Putin's game. Vladimir Putin tries to essentialize the Western world against Russia, saying they are inherently different and cannot cohabit. Diving into our differences might contribute to these essentializations, she wonders. Paulina is not the only one asking herself these questions. In France, this topic is also debated, yet under slightly different terms. Conservatives are often accusing feminist and anti-racist activists to focus on what divides us rather on what we all share, to destroy universalism. They try to change the conversation we want to have about discrimination and make it about identity. I strongly believe we can focus on our different experiences as a representative of a gender, for instance, and still build universalism. Personal and national stories, genders, LGBT life experiences are not sealed box that do not interact with each other. The Senegalese philosopher Suleiman Bashir Diagne advocates in favor of a new universalism, a universalism of translation. A world where each one of us can understand everyone under one condition, the condition of not overlooking them, but putting yourself in their shoes. Let's try to practice this universalism of translation today with our guest Paulina Aronson, sociologist of emotions, exiled in Berlin. She's a former Russian citizen and also an editor at Open Democracy, an activist and a progressist. How are emotions shaped and felt in Moscow and in Petersburg and in all the post-Soviet world today when you are a simple citizen? Is it really different from Paris, from Berlin or from Brest in Brittany? Do we live in different romantic regimes? Have they merged? How can romantic regimes be used politically? Can they explain a little bit of what's going on in this scary world? Welcome to this special episode of the French podcast On peut plus rien dire. Non mais laissez-moi parler. C'est vraiment insupportable. On peut plus rien dire. Vraiment, c'est n'importe quoi. On peut plus rien dire. Et la prochaine fois, ça sera quoi On peut plus rien dire. Qu'est-ce que c'est que ça On peut plus rien dire. My 
Dear Paulina, you wrote a brilliant essay about the difference of perception and difference of construction of love and emotions between the Western world and Russian culture. You explain that our ideas about love and how we express feelings and emotions are dominated by powerful political forces. Forces that are different considering in which side of the world we grew up in. You theorize a notion I find very interesting. It's the notion of romantic regime or the notion of emotional regime. We will see later how we can understand a little bit more about today's war in Ukraine in light of this concept. But first, can you explain to us what is an emotional regime? I have a sense that uh, maybe it's time also for me to reconsider what I have been writing earlier, because uh, the idea of opposing, of contrasting Russia with the West seems very, very wrong right now to me, because this is exactly what, um, to some extent, we are inspired to do by the current Russian policies. We Russians are different than everyone else, and we are the Russian world, and you are someone else, and... Uh, How about we just contrast us to the rest of the world? And uh, maybe um, the wiser approach, uh, the better approach, the more ethical approach is to look for similarities rather than for differences, to look for uh, maybe not similarities, but to look at, at specifics of either approach to life, to emotions, to humanity, um, differentiate uh, what makes post Soviet well special in its own way but i think that it re it is really hard for me to speak about anything russian right now i'm very affected um by what is happening now and i think that uh like many many people who grew up in the soviet union i am unwillingly and probably unknowingly a part of very imperialist look at the world. How so? How would you be a part of the imperialists look at the world? An imperialist outlook at the world that assumes that there is some uh, particular special Russian culture, which maybe even knows best. Um, I would prefer, therefore, to maybe rather talk about post-Soviet. Okay post-Soviet culture and post-Soviet outlook at the world. You know, when we talk about post-Soviet, we're rather focusing on institutions and structures. So what is emotional regime in the first place? You know, why, why do we even assume that different societies have different emotional mm -hmm. regimes? Okay, we may be know about political regimes. We may have heard about economical regimes. Uh, um, we even maybe apply to ourselves a notion of health regime, but what is emotional regime? So emotional regime is a concept which uh, was developed in the framework of uh, cultural anthropology uh, by an anthropologist called William Reddy. He was actually looking at the period of sentimentalism in European history, and uh, he suggested this notion as a concept which de describes a particular set of norms, beliefs, and also linguistic instruments which people use to express emotions, meaning that at different times in history and different places in the world, uh, in different societies, um, the norms of expressing emotions, talking about your emotions and acting upon them are very different. And societies, according to William Reddy, spend a lot of time and effort in educating their members how to treat their emotions. So we don't just, there is no such thing as natural human being, you know, uh, the great French philosopher Rousseau would argue here, but mm -hmm. you know, um, I would rather assume that um, on that part, he was, he was mistaken. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'm very cautious as you can see <laughs> yes <laughs> culture <laughs> and uh, I think I would agree with you that we there is no such thing as a natural human being and we are trained and influenced by the society we grew up in and what did you find out about the western romantic regime is it is it okay to talk about the western romantic regime you know it's it's also a very good question I think that um In some sense, of course, we can't speak about that, you know, but uh, I guess that a more appropriate way of 
uh, distinguishing those romantic regimes would be talking about um, emotional capitalism mm -hmm. and perhaps emotional socialism. That is so interesting. I love this distinction. Let's use this one. <laughs> Let's use this one. Yeah. Because West, the West is also it's such an essentialist concept. It's true. It's true. You can also use co capitalism as an essentialist concept, but at least it brings us straight to uh, social institutions, structures and economic transactions. And this is where the emotional is very much embedded in. So when, when we're talking about uh, econo um, emotional capitalism, we're talking about emotional regime, going back to William Reddy, which treats emotions as capital. It also treats them as commodities, uh, meaning that you own your feelings. You know, this is a very important notion in, uh, in um, therapeutic language. You have to own your emotions and you all, actually you have to invest into relationships. And if you're investing into relationships, well, possibly you're expecting return of investments. So you're dealing on a very particular kind of market where you are a savvy entrepreneur knowing uh, how to get most out of your feelings, you know, mm -hmm. how, uh, how to get most out of love, even how to get most out of your breakup. You know, uh, there is an idea of continuous growth. Growth is a very important notion for capitalism. You know, you always have to add up. Uh, you can't uh, be stagnant. That's very dangerous. So whatever experience in life you're going through, whether it's a pleasant or unpleasant one or positive or negative one, as a pop psychologist probably would put on their Instagram, uh, you are concerned with your growth. Am I growing out of it? So emotional capitalism uh, is, you know, is about treating your feelings as commodities. And uh, um, the probably world's most known sociologist of emotions, uh, Israeli researcher Eva Iluz, uh, has devised a, a concept which I really like. She speaks about uh, emodities. It's a mixture of uh, emotions and commodities. So this is, a, this is a very particular kind of, this is a very fundamental trait of emotional capitalism. And I guess, you know, the thing is that like capitalism has so many faces and capitalism in Sweden is just not the same as capitalism in Great Britain. And capitalism in the U.S. is not the same as capitalism in Germany, you know, and, and you have very different nuances and very different kinds. And so emotional capitalism is also not some kind of a, you know, homogenous entity, uh, meaning that all people in the West are the same, you know. Uh, of course, of course. There is a very different spectrum of what can happen there. But there is this fundamental idea about a, a very particular kind of subjectivity, a person who owns themselves, a person who is autonomous, and a person who is perpetually engaged in making choices. And that's a very fundamental thing about the emotional capitalism, that if you are an emotional entrepreneur, then uh, you are busy making choices, choices about the investments, choices about your partners, choices about kinds of contracts that you um, enter into with his partners, etc. Is this why you wrote about the emotional capitalism as the regime of choice? You can call it the regime of choice. Yes, I think that this is a. Um, it's they're pretty synonymous. Those notions, I would say, and what makes um, post-Soviet emotional regime different is that it treats subjectivity, it treats a personhood in a very different way, that it doesn't attribute um, choice. To an individual in 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 such a um, in the same manner, actually, it is rather the opposite. Is the whole post-Soviet setting, the whole Soviet experience, the whole socialist experience, was actually very much telling people that they have little choice uh, in their personal lives, that their lives are more or less predestined. And that as subjects, they are to a greater extent part of the collective than personal entrepreneurs. This subjectivity very much defines how people felt about their feelings. You know, feelings happened to you. You didn't own them. You, uh, feelings weren't your capital. Mm. They were just existing, uh, you know, somewhere out there and they were happening to you and smashing you and crashing you. and Um, the narratives, the grand narratives of uh, Russian literature from the 19th century uh, are feeding into this idea to a great extent, you know, 
the narratives of the Russian uh, Orthodox Church are also supporting this idea. You know, the subjectivity of an Orthodox uh, believer is very different from the subjectivity of a Protestant believer. Let's take, for instance, if I may, uh, a concrete example. If I fall in love, for instance, with a married man, and tomorrow I'll talk about it with my friends in Paris, I'm pretty sure their reaction would, from my friends would be, oh, Judith, you should seek counseling. You should like work and try to understand within yourself why you are attracted to such a bad uh, situation. And uh, I should work on myself so I won't make this mistake again. And in, behind my back, I think they would judge me a little bit for making like such poor life choices. And uh, this is what we do. How would my friends react if I was doing the same, falling in love with a married man, but in, in Petersburg, for instance? I think in contemporary Petersburg, it would be very similar. Actually, you know, it's an interesting essentialization of cultural beliefs, because while probably receiving the precisely this kind of reaction you were describing uh, in an educated, call it middle class, if you wish, um, milieu in St. Petersburg, these people would assume that would that happen to them in France? Nobody would actually, <laughs> in France, everybody just sleeps with each other. We all know that. Oh. <laughs> you lovers, don't you? <laughs> so this regime of choice, it has made its way in some uh, categories of people in the post-Soviet space. I think it's a very interesting process. What we're actually um, observing in Russia now is an establishment or, I mean, now with the war, I think many, many things will, will change. So at the moment, we're really observing uh, a deconstruction of uh, what we, we call therapeutic turn. But for the last 30 years, since the demise of the Soviet Union, uh, the former Soviet space has actually really undergone this cultural um, process, which anthropologists and sociologists call um, therapeutic turn, meaning that the definition of subjectivity, the definition of an individual um, has become determined by notions from psychotherapy. And the notions made their way into popular culture. So it's not just about you going to see a therapist on the couch, but it's about a whole so-called psych culture, which exists, you know, uh, in mass media, which in the course of the last 10 to 15 years exists in social media, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a very interesting phenomenon how this notion of an alien sovereign individual, the subject which owns their life, how it arrived into the former Soviet Union together with the so-called shock therapy of the economic reforms and the shock therapy of the Russian, the Soviet economy has coincided or to some extent also fed into the shock therapy of the former Soviet soul. So the Soviet individual had to completely remake themselves uh, into Uh, into an entrepreneur. Is it a trauma for the Soviet individual? Well, you know, Vladimir Putin says that, uh, you know, that we have gone through the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of uh, whatever, 20th century, you know. So the collapse of the USSR was definitely traumatic for many people. At the same time, it was very liberating for some other people. And to a great extent, it was both traumatic and liberating at the same time. Mm. What it led to, on a very personal level, was a necessity to reconsider your whole subjectivity, your whole personhood, and of course, your attitude to your personal life, to your emotional life, to the ways you build relationships, to the way you put yourself um, out into the world. And therapeutic instruments and therapeutic practices have taken a very significant place in this process. Uh, because where the Soviet ideology previously used to be teaching a person about what they should be like and what they should feel and how they should fall in love and who they should marry and how they should have sex, how they should not have sex, uh, this place was now empty and it had to be taken by something. And different ideas about personhood emerged in that place, you know, the esoteric ideas, uh, ideological, you know, ideals as well, but also therapeutic approaches. and. It would be wrong to say that there was no psychology in the USSR. There was, but it was very, very limited to scientific research of a very particular kind, we could say. So what there was definitely not really present in the USSR was therapy. Mm -hmm. Psychology as a science practiced in 
labs, you know, and uh, studied by a very narrow group of people, but there was no practice of counseling, hardly any. There was hardly any, and there was definitely no therapy in the in the Western sense. Um, so I think a very interesting thing which happened is that this ideal of sovereign autonomous individual has to some extent very much coincided with the feeling of uh, alienation that people felt in the Soviet Union in its uh, later decades, you know, the inability to rely on anything, uh, the actual complete distrust to state and its institutions, and strong belief into just um, having to rely on yourself and no one else. It is very much coincided with the, uh, you know, this imported ideals, uh, um, you know, from Ayn Rand. Mm. That you have to stand tall and you have to make everything on your own. And, and my favorite formula, um, the world doesn't owe you anything. Uh, there is a very famous um, formula or, you know, concept uh, um, which um, developed by, um, I think it's Varlam Shalamov, uh, a Soviet um, writer who reflected on his experience in Gulag, who has, um, he coined this formula, don't believe, don't be afraid, don't ask. This is, this is the formula of a Sovieth-hood, of a Soviet personhood, you know? It's at the same time very strong and very scary. I, I mean, to me, it's... Yeah. yeah. It basically means that you're on your own. Yes. There's yeah. nothing up there. The world is a dangerous place. The world is going to let you down. Uh, you can't trust anybody. It's just you out there. Yeah. And this is what you learn when you grow up in a, in the Soviet space or the post-Soviet space. This is what you learn about the world. Like, you're on your own. This is what you learned about the world if you grew up in the Soviet Union. And I mean, of course, there were people who grew up in very, very... Um, protected environment, but so many people lost uh, their relatives uh, in the purges. So many people lost uh, their families in the wars. And, you know, um, I don't think that the, this uh, idea of uh, Soviet folk, like Soviet people living together in a great uh, togetherness uh, holds true. You know, it's an ideological strain. And Uh, yes, the idea of collective was important, nevertheless, but how did we define this collective? Who were the people who we trusted? Who were the people who relied on? It's very different from what the kind of ideological surface uh, was um, was telling us. So the arrival of this therapeutic ideals of self-made person, self- of the you know, emotional capitalism. They fell on a very fertile ground in a very interesting way, you know, because people in the 90s, people were faced with these ideas, you know, they were faced with the necessity to suddenly buy and sell. Nobody knew how to buy and sell in the Soviet Union. You know, buying and selling was uh, was immoral, was considered immoral. And suddenly we're told, well, this is great. Buying and selling is how you make your way in, into life. Uh, this is what makes you into a really cool person. The more you sell, the more profit you make. And uh, the more profit you make, the better person you are. And to get there, you have to completely rebuild yourself from the inside. And this is when the psychological arrives. This is when the new emotional regime is necessary to produce new type of citizenhood. And so pop psychology has become a very strong political tool to shape those new individuals, you know, to create a new post-Soviet citizen who would be able to live on their own, to pursue their own ideals and uh, to achieve some kind of, you know, ideal sovereignty. So sorry to interrupt you, but now it's time for a little break. Thank you for being with us. This is On Peut Plus Rien Dire, the French podcast. And we are asking ourselves if our emotions are universal with the sociologist Paulina Aronson. In your essay about a romantic regime, you wrote about, so I'm not talking about the like the politics here, but about the people, that like to Russians, love remains a destiny, an 
moral mm -hmm. act and a value. It is irresistible. It requires sacrifice and it implies suffering and pain. The Russians consider maturity to be the capacity to bear pain, sometimes to an absurd degree. I thought this sentence was very strong and very interesting. The Russians consider maturity to be the capacity to bear pain. Um, would you still say it's the case? Uh, has like emotional capitalism changed that? Or is it still something very strong? If you grew up like in Petersburg, in Moscow, or anywhere in the country of Russia, like people that are able to go through horrible pain, are they seen as strong, courageous, mature, like good people? I think that these notions have changed very much since I have written that article. I think, uh, how old is that? It's probably six years. Mm. And the six years were actually really important um, because this therapeutic turn, which the West has been going through for decades throughout the 20th century, like everything, uh, like everything in Russia, you know, we had it in an explosive form and in a grotesque form and in a very aggressive form, you could say. And I think that... Uh, the adoption of the ideas that uh, emotional health is about avoiding pain has very much made its way into um, educated Russian urban population. And there are very good reasons for it, because, of course, you know, the Russians, the Russians or the, the history of Soviet Russia and, you know, pre-Soviet Russia as well, the Tsarist Russia, was so full of violence, so full of atrocities. You know, what we see in Ukraine now is a very logical continuation of history in this part of the world. The idea that enduring this pain actually is a wrong thing, that we need to do everything possible to resist this pain, that violence has to be stopped, that uh, we need to learn how to protect ourselves, in last couple of decades in Russia has really acquired political meaning, very much so. And uh, it is on the one hand, an extremely important and very liberating process, because suddenly in the last decade, we were talking about home violence, for example. That's something that was just not spoken about before. And the way the Russian state resists to this conversation is very telling, you know, The way, you know, they mark uh, feminists as foreign agents and undesirable members of society and basically enemies of the folk, you know, it's very telling. And this resistance to pain, this unwillingness to experience it, uh, I think it very much marks uh, the last, I would say, maybe five years of uh, Russia's public discourse. And... I started with this being a very liberating experience on the one hand, you know, uh, it, it's an important point of self-reflection. How much pain do we want to endure? You know, is it really important? Aren't we just sick and tired of that? And uh, why don't we just start putting ourselves uh, in a better place, taking care of our needs, putting the mask always first on ourselves, making sure that we replenish our resources and, you know, all this fridge magnet phrases, you know, all of this is important. All of this is really important for the part of the world where people never had any private space, where people never had any opportunity to really take care of themselves, where they had so little opportunities to make private choices. So you can, you can definitely see it as a form of, well, if you will, a Western style capitalist liberation, but it's a very, very new liberal in how it reduces all problems of the world to one individual. Mm. And it just tells you, well, if you're discontent with the world, something must be wrong with you. So mm. why don't you just put yourself in a better place, take better care of yourself and of your needs, and then maybe you will feel better. And the most important thing is that you don't feel pain, because if you're feeling pain, then something must be wrong with you. Maybe you haven't worked out through your traumas, and maybe you have not worked enough with your therapist, and maybe you're acting uh, without enough self-reflection and doing stupid things. And the downside of it is that, it's that it very much depoliticizes the society. I keep reading yet and again, yet and again, yet and again, you know, uh, utterances of 
pop psychologists, you know, I'm, I'm really not talking about the level of private therapy of person to person therapy right now. It is extremely important what happens there, but what I'm trying to talk about is public discourse. And those are two very different pairs of shoes, as the Germans are saying. And I really want to make this distinction so that I'm not just sort of pointing a finger to the therapeutic profession and saying, of course, oh, of course. Yeah. I'm talking about the so-called psych culture. Yeah, right? the personal development culture. Self-help. Self-help, right? yeah, self-help. Um, do, do you think that to some extent Vladimir Putin would be somehow nostalgic of this resistance to pain, to these old Russian resist values? You know, actually not. The funny thing is that Vladimir Putin and his regime are extremely savvy in using the tools of this self-help culture in order to repress political initiative or political activism. Mm. It is very peculiar how they do it. So in December 2021, uh, the Russian, um, power, the Russian, whatever, Kremlin um, made a court decision to close uh, Memorial Society. This is the um, one of the oldest Russian human rights defending uh, organizations, which um, investigates um, human rights crimes and uh, in particular, the history of Russian purges and everything that is related to them. This organization has existed for 30, for more than 30 years, and they have been really digging the archives about uh, people who died in Stalinist purges. They were organizing expeditions to places of mass burials, and you know they are uh, extremely important in doing the memory work. By closing them, the Russian power has given a very clear signal that they're not going to tolerate uh, any attempt to investigate uh, breaches of human rights uh, mm -hmm. in the country. But the official reason that they gave uh, to the public was that uh, investigations of the Memorial Society are causing depression in Russian citizens. Yeah, using like the well-being of people as an argument to hide uh, politics, to hide crimes. It's Absolutely. The same reason was used to block Instagram uh, in the beginning of the war against Ukraine when they said that uh, images presented on Instagram are um, um, upsetting mm. Russian people and they're disrupting. It's all fake. Obviously, it's all fake, clearly. You know, all these uh, people who are, who we see in Bucha and in Irpin and in other places in uh, Ukraine, it's all staged. Uh, but all these staged appearances, they upset the psyche of the Russian uh, citizens and we need to protect them so we don't let that happen. And uh, Instagram and Facebook are named extremist extremist organizations in uh, <gasps> Russia at the moment, uh, partially because they're disrupting the mental health of Russian citizens. So it's a very interesting conflation of this um, mental health and mental purity and uh, personal borders, uh, unwillingness to experience pain. It's very, very peculiar how Putin's regime is using those concepts to justify and legitimize themselves. And, you know, I think one concept which explains this conflation is, is neoliberalism. I mean, uh, it is also a bulldozer concept, as we, as we sociologists say, you know, it explains everything and nothing at the same time, but <laughs> you could really use it, I think, because it's about an individual that just minds their own fucking business. It's extremely profitable to a regime like Putin to have 150 million of population, with each of who is just minding their own business. Because if you raise people to, to be like that, then they don't protest. Then they only think about their own profit. And when um, a war starts, uh, they say, well, we don't know the whole truth, do we? We can't really know the whole truth. We only can take care of our families and our loved ones. And that's, you know, already too much for us, even that, you know, everybody should know how much responsibility they can take upon themselves. And mm. what I wanted to say earlier, you know, I keep reading again and again and again and again utterances of Russian pop psychologists who tell you that if you're going in a protest, it's a sign of um, poor separation from your parents. You're protesting against parental ideals. Well, maybe you should reconsider uh, your own. Where, where where do you read that? In, in the Facebook, Facebook, Facebook Instagram. Instagram, everywhere, like like psychologists telling you that if you go to a protest, it's like a childish um, re reaction. Not necessarily, but it might be. Maybe you should reconsider. Maybe, you know, maybe you're looking in the wrong place. 
maybe you should take better care of yourself. Think about your life goals. And instead of going to stupid protests, actually organize your life in a better in a better way. Let me just give you two examples. So one comes from, uh, again, please, I really want to underline it. It's I'm talking about public discourse. And it's b- because I know how much my f- colleagues, my friends, psychologists are protesting and saying we're different. We don't really work with clients like that. And I know it's true. But what ends up on the surface and what actually sticks to people's minds because the percentage of Russians who can actually afford private therapy is minimal. It's a tiny, 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 tiny part of the society, but a huge amount of people reads those texts and watches those videos where these ideas are being transmitted, you know, en masse. So two examples. One is a blog of a very popular, um, you could call it, self-help coach, guru, I don't know what she calls herself, a psychologist, but I seriously doubt she is, um, where she um, she has devised her own system of beliefs and concepts, and she uses her own language to describe what happens between people. And it's extremely uh, self-focused. It's extremely uh, radical in how you should understand your personal borders. And uh, minding your own business is just, you know, the absolute bottom line of uh, her blog. And it's being read by hundreds of thousands of people. It's very, very popular. So um, one of the features uh, on her blog is that she discusses with people there. You can write a letter to her explaining your situation and she will ask everybody in the group, all her readers to discuss it. So it's a kind of like a public, uh, public, uh, what do you call it? Um, execution, if you wish. And uh, in most instances, the people writing about the love problems, right? I mean, what concerns people most? Love. So I remember very clearly uh, a letter, uh, an email, whatever, description from a lady writing from Moscow. Her readers are mostly savvy, urban, and educated um, milieu. So a lady from a Moscow outskirts living in one of the newly built, rather expensive apartment blocks, which are like in the middle of nowhere, uh, expensive, uh, kind of, you know, gated communities, which are hard to get to, hard to get out. And um, she's writing about falling in love with a neighbor in this house um, who she met during a local protest because uh, their particular gated community is located in such a horrible place that it takes two and a half hours to get to Moscow. There are traffic jams all the time. There are no not enough parking spaces. And, you know, to make local municipalities aware about their problems, people in this gated community organized and went to protest. So she's describing all that. And then she meets this young active man. She falls in love with him, but he's quite indifferent. The author of the blog, the so-called psychologist, uh, is responding to it uh, by saying, well, how would you expect anybody to fall in love with you if you're such an immature person? If you don't like the place where you live, well, go and make more money and move somewhere else. But going in a protest... Who they think you are? Why do you think the world owes you anything? So that's example oh, number. I'm speechless. Oh, it's 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 so brutal and it's so brutal. Yeah, I don't know what else to say. It feels like a, um, a capitalistic nightmare. It is. It is in a way. You know, the shape that new liberal discourse took in Russia is extremely rabid. You know, that's, I guess, if we can talk about it, if, if you allow me some essentialist ideas, and I would say that yes. um, this propensity to turn every idea into a very rabid form of itself is something that Russia is prone to. <laughs> and I see how it can kill any attempt to, to change anything in your life. If you're like mad about something, if it's always your fault for not making enough money or not living in this good yeah. place or not like uh, taking the good decisions to move somewhere else, yeah, then nothing can either change collectively. And that's a problem. And that's a problem because, of course, the kind of violence that the Russian state is exercising against the citizens during protests or not, you don't even have to protest anymore. You know, you can put a like on Facebook and you can go to prison for 15 years for it, you know. Uh, so the kind of violence that the Russian state is exercising is definitely extreme. And for many people, it's a very serious consideration. Do I speak up? Do I open my mouth? Or do I actually just keep to my own business? You know, the idea that it's not just 
necessary for survival, but actually psychologically healthy to not protest, to just mind your own business is very attractive. And this is, it's, it's a tool to explain the reality for many people. And this is what I think is so upsetting. Um, you know, a, um, a, a colleague of mine, uh, if I may call him a colleague, uh, a brilliant anthropologist in the Duke University, uh, Thomas Matzer, he has written a fantastic book called uh, Shock Therapy, which describes um, stages of development in Russian uh, psychological discourse, you know, and he looked at pop psychology and professional psychologists uh, as well. And he um, writes about a very important transition which happened uh, somewhere in 2000s. Um, in the late 90s and in the early 2000s, in the early Putin years, uh, pop psychology was still quite focused on a subject which was built into some fine sorts of communities. It was very much about how to negotiate with other people in order to achieve some sort of equilibrium or maybe to come to some, um, you know, maybe to, to, how to, to how to make a contract with other people in order to get what you need. You know, this is also a very classic idea. It's very much like Dale Carnegie, whatever. It's, 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 it's very American, very pop psychological, very focused on um, how to how to make your connections profitable. But yet yeah, it was very much focused on connections. So in a very similar situation, uh, in the beginning of 2000s, uh, a man who called into uh, a talk show on uh, radio uh, Echo of Moscow, Echo Moskvi, which was also now turned down by Putin, uh, was asking very similar question that the woman uh, in this letter was asking, saying, oh, you know, our state case is looking so horribly and, you know, it stinks here and the state is doing nothing. And I called our municipal leaders 500 times and, you know, it's still t t totally decrepit and, you know, something has to be done. And uh, the psychologist in the studio is saying, well, you are the master of your own fate. Call your neighbors, buy a bucket of paint, get some paintbrushes, clean the staircase and paint it. Bingo. You are the citizen of this country and you have rights, but also you have obligations and you can act as an, as a, you know, as an, um, as a proactive individual. And here we see an example of collective action. A person is being told, go call on your neighbor's doors and do it together. 20 years later, we're told if you are calling on other people's doors, you must be psychologically uh, immature. You are unable to provide yourself with everything you need. If you don't like the color of the staircase where you live, move. Make more money. Get out of there. Do you think it's also some kind of a coping mechanism because the life is too violent and you have to tell to yourself that it's somehow your fault because it's somehow unbearable to face what's really happening? It's a very important point. Thank you for making it. I am convinced about that and it's very, very sad. And um, 2000. 19, just basically a couple of weeks before the uh, start of the massive lockdown, me and um, my colleague and my co-author, uh, Vladislav Zemenkov, his uh, uh, PhD student in Chicago University, uh, we conducted uh, about 20 interviews with um, people aged 20 to 30 years old in one of the Russian big cities, you know, where they have like at least a million people. And we were talking about their personal lives. We, you know, we were just asking them a question. Tell us about your, there is this particular expression in the Russian language for it. Tell us about personal life, meaning mostly, you know, your sex and love life. And uh, what really struck us is, was this distinction that people made between the private and the public and how the private life seemed, they were so obsessed with control about their private life that You know, it had to be ruled. It had to be organized. They had to be setting personal borders. And indeed, every instance of pain was considered to be an absolutely un, um, unacceptable. It's at least in the private, I want to have my ideal world where I am going to close myself with a carefully chosen partner with who I'm going to play by carefully chosen rules. And this is going to be just my decision, how I do it. And the whole world can go and piss themselves off. And if this is not available to me, then I'm not going to have any partner at all. And the most important thing is that the 
nobody owes anything to anybody. This is this is their bottom line. We heard it so many times in the interviews, and it's really, really, it's a very scary idea how people just keep repeating it. The world doesn't owe you anything. Nobody owes anything to to anyone. Um, you are on your own. You and your partner, you're two completely sovereign individuals. Uh, and I fully understand this desire to emancipate yourself, you know, from the patriarchal ideals, which are still so present in the Russian society. And they're expressing themselves on every possible level in political and public reality. And so when you are on your own in your personal relations and you're trying to reorganize this world, it's a very strong reaction that I just want to make everything different here. Everything is going to be completely different. And if in my social life, I'm always a, you know, owing something to someone and the state can always do anything to me. Never, doesn't matter what, you know, and the market is organized in such a brutal way that I have no control over it. Well, then at least in my private life, I will pretend, you know, I'll make myself into this absolutely sovereign entrepreneur and don't you step on my, uh, on, on, on my feet here. And a really very important, um, thing is happening now during the war, I think people are starting to reconsider this idea of the world doesn't owe you anything. And just to finish off this idea, uh, I was really, really um, struck by uh, a suicidal note left by uh, a mathematician from Donetsk. He was born in Ukraine, he was born in Donetsk, and then he moved to Russia as a young man. He started a career of research in Russia, and then the Russia started the war. And he was trying to flee. He was trying to go somewhere else. And the Russian authorities didn't let him out of the country. And he decided to kill himself rather than to stay, you know, to remain a, a part of this. And he, in, the, in his suicide note, uh, he wrote that um, he has gone through, he, he, he has had crisis in his life previously. And uh, it's not the first time he was thinking about suicide. And in the previous instances, he would just watch some YouTube videos of pop psychologists who were telling him, the world doesn't owe you anything. And he was like, well, actually that used to help me. I used to pull my shit together and just get on with my life and I didn't kill myself. But now when I see this happening, I actually think, well, fuck that. The world owes me. The world owes to each of us. The world owes justice. The world owes protection. The world owes civility. And if the world doesn't offer us, well, then something is really fucked up in this world. And I don't want to believe that the world doesn't owe us anything. And I think it's just such a powerful statement, you know, such a powerful idea that he expresses. I'd like to ask you um, one, maybe one or two last questions. Um, Vladimir Putin, is he somehow an ambassador for old masculinity or patriarchy? <laughs> I think he is ambassador for... I mean, it's it's such a cliche, but he definitely is such an ambassador for toxic masculinity. I mean, if you think about what they did to Alexei Navalny, you know, rubbing poison into his underpants. I mean, if this is not toxic masculinity, <laughs> yeah, it's literally toxic masculinity. You know, it's true. It's true. It's literally concrete toxic masculinity. Rubbing Novichok into seams of his underpants. That's quite telling. It tells you everything about the nature of this regime and uh, its, uh, you know, its approach to power. And uh, wasn't it your president Emmanuel Macron to who Putin said uh, uh, during negotiations uh, he he dropped this uh, phrase, which actually Russian gangsters use when they rape. Mm, said, yeah. like not, you have to endure. Нравится, не нравится, терпимая красавица. Well, I will fuck you anyways. You know. Um, This is, he's the ambassador of this um, gangster masculinity, of this toxic masculinity, if you wish. I don't think he is the ambassador of every sort of masculinity. You know, there are different masculinities, but unfortunately his regime is very supportive of this particular kind. And yes, it installs it everywhere. It teaches boys to be like this. And we're very far you know, from being um, a feminist country. And do you think this war is also... Um somehow defensive of the world changing and the gender roles in the global world changing and this is unbearable to him yes i think so i mean to, i mean i don't know whether you heard whether you heard of the speech of the russian patriarch uh, kirill who spoke on the behalf of the whole orthodox church at the beginning of the war 
I mean, it's like one face palm after the other, you know, it's, it's terrible. So when the war just started and uh, the church had to take a stance on it, uh, the patriarch had stepped out and he said, well, that, of course, you know, we are ne- we're never for violence. We're never for violence. And we're out there to protect our darling Ukrainians from the brutal Western values. Um, and people in Donetsk are forced to live in a country which supports gay parades. To be a part of the world, to be a part of the so-called progressive world, you now have to support gay parades. And Ukraine is has become a toy in the hands of the Western civilization. And Ukraine is now supporting this gay values. And our poor comrades, Russians in Donbas in the west in the south <laughs> in the east of Ukraine, they now have to live with it. Uh, they weren't asked, but now they also are part of this and we need to protect them. So of course, gay parades is not the most important thing in this equation, you know, and it's only used symbolically. And who knows, who the fuck knows what Putin needs in Ukraine? Nobody knows that, you know, he doesn't need it for its grain. He doesn't need it for its potatoes. He doesn't need it for uh, the coal of Donbass. And, you know, it's economically, it's not, it's not a kind of a war uh, for resources. It definitely isn't. It is a war of ideology. Seeing a country just next to him, which speaks a similar language, you know, to this part, like, you know, big, big, big part of this country speaks the same language. The country which has done the same transition from the socialist regime, suddenly installing democratic procedures and suddenly at least aspiring to some kind of um, I wouldn't say aspiring to democracy. You know, Ukraine, unfortunately, also is not a real functional, um, how should I say, you know, Ukraine really before the war was very self-critical as well of its own problems. And, you know, we know that labor rights in Ukraine are not in the best condition, you know, and um, Ukraine also is a very new liberal country. You know, they, they don't really necessarily have welfare system in place that can support their citizens. But none of this is really of our concern at the moment. They have to win. They have to win. And they are so much more on the way to democratic regime than Russia is. And I think for Putin, it's unbearable to see people elected their own president. What? Who told them they can? You know, it's it's just unacceptable to him. And and gender roles in Ukraine, uh, it's a totally different story. You should rather ask someone else about that. But um, at least declaratively, Ukraine is a lot much further on that front than uh, Russia is. Uh, well, thank you so much, Paulina. It's been so interesting talking with you. I didn't realize how... Like the mixture of the post-Soviet trauma and capitalism and neoliberalism, what it created, like such a violent society. It's so scary what you described. It's. I think this is probably the most interesting thing to look at. And um, a very good friend of mine, and he is a really, really, really smart Russian political scientist and sociologist. Uh, he um, organized a study about debt in Russia, like debt. Mm. Like debt. And... Um, It's like one of the scariest things I read in my life because they went into small cities talking to people who went into a really bad death and people are saying things like, well, you can't count on anyone. And the, the, like these people have become victims of microcredit organizations because they feel that it, they are not, they can't, it's not acceptable to turn to others for help when they are in trouble. So, or when you just want something, you want a new iPhone, mm. uh, you can't, talk to your relatives to lend you money for it because everybody's going to look at you like you're small and you can't make your own money. So you go into a microcredit organization, you take money out and then you become a slave. And it's like one story after the other, one story after the other. And each of them is underpinned by the idea that we all have to be sovereign and independent. And all these people in pursuit of their sovereignty and independency end up in prison or commit suicide. And not all of them, not all of them, but the heroes of their stories You know, people who ended up in these horrible situations were initially driven by the very opposite idea. They wanted to be completely independent of the society. And, you know, his research is about money, but it completely chimes with everything that we hear about everything else. Yeah, it's like the dictatorship of self-sufficiency. 
Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Oh, well, such a nice, such a nice title. Yeah. And I think this is what actually also fuels this war because Putin says Russia doesn't need any foreign friends. We're self-sufficient. We don't need anything. You don't need your McDonald's. We don't need your Netflix. We don't need your Spotify. We don't need your whatever euros, dollars. We're self-sufficient. Thank you so much, my friends, for being with us. And many special thanks to you, Paulina, for all this knowledge you shared with us. I'm sure your next book will be fascinating as well. Thanks to our producer, Charlotte Bex. Thanks to our sound engineers, Elisa Grenet and Thomas Alvidal. On peut plus rien dire, it's every Friday on every platform, but usually it's in French, but come listen to us. On peut plus rien dire.